It's Friday, December 6, 2013, and this is The Product Mentor. The Product Mentor, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, is a program where we get mentors and mentees from all over the world together um, to help everyone, to help product people just make better decisions, make better products, and be better product people. Um, this is one part of our program um, where the mentors are participating in the program and the mentees, as you can see along the bottom of your screen, um, participate in a live stream chat conversation around a specific topic. Today's speaker is Raviv Turner, VP of Product at Tap Influence, um, and he's going to lead a lesson for us all today in creating, maintaining, and prioritizing a roadmap, something that all us product people uh, are, uh, do quite, find ourselves doing quite a bit and can always use uh, some, uh, some new tips. Um, so just allow me to briefly explain the format for those of you who are joining and uh, for those of you perhaps on the bottom of the screen uh, who are a little bit new to this as well. Um, it, uh, Raviv will be leading a presentation, a, a conversation, and I'll be jumping in and moderating from time to time. Um, and I am Jeremy Horn, the product guy, um, and jumping in from time to time to help uh, kind of work in some of the questions, um, especially if you're participating through Google Moderator, our area where if you have questions for the group and you're not in the live stream, you definitely have an opportunity to ask questions, and I will ask them of Raviv as they come in, um, so that uh, everyone, whether you're in the program, the product mentor program, or not, um, has an opportunity to uh, learn from one of the experts, Raviv. Um, so uh, if everyone could just wave hi for a second. Hi, yay. Um, and so what I'd like to do is very briefly just kind of go around the room, just a quick introduction, you know, just a second or two. Um, and don't forget to unmute yourself as you start your introductions. Uh, and let's uh, start with Carlos. Hey everybody, my name is Carlos. I am a mentee. I make digital products and uh, I really enjoy this. Excellent. And Franz. Hi everyone, my name is Franz. I am a mentee. Uh, Raviv is actually my mentor. I make mobile products for American Express business travel. And that's it. Excellent. Orion. Hey everyone, my name is Orion. I am a mentee as well, and I am a product manager at a tech startup called Inspark in New York City. Excellent. And to Raviv. Hey, I'm uh, Raviv Turner, and I'm uh, Franz Mentor and uh, your presenter for tonight, broadcasting from the icy cold border, where Excellent. the temperature is 3 Fahrenheit. Excellent. Uh, and to William. Hi, everyone. I'm William. I'm a mentee in this program. I live out in California, but I just moved out from New York, and I'm a product manager at Dice.com. Very cool. And I am Jeremy Horn, the product guy, and your moderator for you this evening. So if I do anything weird with the camera, allow me to apologize to everyone ahead of time. Um, so we're in for a really, a really exciting time. Uh, and with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Raviv uh, to take it away. Raviv? Hey guys, uh, thank you Jeremy and uh, thank you for the folks as part of the uh, Product Mentor program. It's been a great program so far, uh, working together with friends and uh, looking at products and talking uh, about products. Um, the presentation for tonight is about uh, creating, maintaining and prioritizing the product roadmap. Um, so I will go and switch uh, to the other screen and share uh, my deck with you. Can you guys see my deck? Yeah, we're good. Just take Perfect. it away. Perfect. So before we start, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been doing uh, a product, mostly software products, uh, um, product management for the past 30 years. I'm currently a, a VP product at uh, Tap Influence. What Tap Influence does is an uh, enterprise social content marketing platform that lets uh, Fortune 2000 brands and agencies crowdsource their content marketing to uh, fans, advocates, and uh, online influencers, uh, more of a collaborative content hub. Uh, before that, I was uh, co-founder and CEO of a social gaming startup um, out of New York, actually. I uh, moved last year from New York to Boulder. Um, and done other uh, uh, positions, uh, uh, working uh, with teams, developing uh, both consumer and business products. 
um, graduated from a, a great, great program uh, at uh, NYU called ITP. Those of you are familiar with the uh, product. So tonight we'll talk about the product roadmap and the approach I'd like to uh, take is kind of work it from the inside out or start with the why. Uh, if you are a fan of uh, um, uh, Simon Sinek, um, Google his name up. He always uh, talk about how you should start with the why, uh, which I find very appealing. Um, and according to Simon, that's, that's a principle actually grounded in the tenets of uh, biology. So uh, I'm going to uh, try and open with the why and talk to what's called your limbic brain. Uh, that's the part of the brain that uh, is uh, responsible for the purpose, context, emotion, and then we're gonna transition to the uh, to the how and the what, and, and move to the kind of neocortex uh, type of your brain uh, and, and talk more kind of rational and logical and, and look at the different examples. But um, that's that's a big topic. Uh, roadmaps, product roadmaps are a big topic, and there are several useful proven techniques to, to to create a roadmap, to maintain a roadmap. Um, I'll try, you know, and sample what's out there, and then, of course, uh, provide my tips and advice about things and tools that I'll be using. Um, so going from more of a strategic uh, kind of look at roadmaps into the how to keep a roadmap for what are kind of best uh, best tools out there. Um, and again, feel free to use the moderator and, and, and jump and ask me uh, questions. So starting with the why, let's talk about why would you want to create a roadmap. Um, and I think the, the first and foremost thing to understand about product roadmaps um, is that a roadmap is a strategic communication tool. Um, that's first. Uh, some of you, um, I started my career, for example, actually playing both product owner and product manager role, right? So as a product owner, you're running inside the sprint, you're working, if, if you're working agile, you're working with the devs. Um, and this is where you gotta kind of get tactical and talk backlogs and lots of uh, details and, and jump into like design and engineering stories. But if, if you focus up for a second on the product manager part, this is where you gotta go and, and, and keep the strategic part. And this is where a roadmap can, can come to the end. Um, so a roadmap uh, is not a, um, a Gantt chart, for example. Um, a roadmap is something which is more high level, kind of 30,000 feet where you look at your product from a product strategy point. Um, hopefully, when you sit down to develop a, a roadmap, you already have some sort of a product strategy. So I want to believe that you, you've done all these kind of great things, which I guess other presenters would talk about this uh, part of the series, but like problem solution fit, and then your product market fit, and customer development and segmentation, and all the great strategic things. When you come to create a roadmap, you are kind of past this. Uh, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to you know, think of a roadmap if you don't have a product strategy. So I would definitely recommend start with a product strategy first before you sit down to, uh, to build a, a roadmap. And so the other things here on the list is you want to make sure that uh, the roadmap clearly communicates your business goals. We're going to talk about different business goals as part of the uh, presentation tonight, and how you can work them into your roadmap. Um, and of course, uh, make sure that your roadmap gets value to your customers. Um, very important. We'll present a model, you know, of how to think of features and think of your roadmap in terms of value to your customers. Um, and last, uh, you want to align uh, the product with stakeholders. And you use the roadmap to communicate this. Um, here at App Influence and uh, uh, Fire Companies I work with, um, every other week or so we'll get together with these stakeholders and talk about you know what's coming, what we just released. I'll give a demo, and we always kind of go back to the roadmap. And tonight I'll share the roadmap I'm using with you as much as I can share. You know I have to blur some areas uh, just so if we have any uh, competitors here tonight, they don't sniff the roadmap. But um, I'll share with you the tools I'm using and, and the approach I'm taking to, uh, to maintain the ego. Um, so let's talk for a second about getting a buying because you're going to use your roadmap uh, to get buying. It can be buying from other stakeholders, it can be a buying from your boss, a buying from a CEO, a buy, buying from your investors, buying from something you want to go to your customers and present something. Um, so if you watch Jeremy Maguire, you know, this kind of shot on the screen, probably one of the best buying scenes in the uh, 
uh, um, history of films, my opinion. This is where he gets on the phone and gets the buy-in for all of his uh, past talents, you know, to move uh, and work his, uh, with his agency. Um, and instead of showing them the money, where well, you do want to show the money, uh, but on the roadmap, you know, you want to show them the process. Um, so instead of just going and saying, hey, this is my roadmap, uh, one good uh, way to get a buy-in is actually make the stakeholders, so the people that care about the roadmap, be part of the process, show them the process, share it with them. Um, it's a great way, based on my personal experience, to get the buy-in, saying something like, hey, can I get a few minutes of your time, I would like you to refine my roadmap, whether this is a VP engineering or VP sales um, or a CEO or even a kind of key customer. Um, it would make everything else so much easier when, when it's time to get the buy-in because now they already invested in this. They are part of putting your product uh, roadmap together or at least providing feedback about it. <coughs> So next, um, I want to talk about how to create a roadmap. Um, and there are a few things you would like to do along the way of, of putting the roadmap together. Um, uh, you'd like to collect feedback. You'd like to maybe sit with your uh, VP engineering or CTO and talk about, uh, if you work agile, you're probably familiar with the term story points. Um, you'd like to go and estimate at least big epics or big features on your roadmap. Um, and then, of course, you'd like to prioritize, you'd like to assess some of the stories, and then again, go again and reprioritize till you feel comfortable, you know, with, with your roadmap or a set of features of, of what you're going to uh, sit down and, uh, and do. Um, and, of course, uh, you then like to get it approved. Um, we do have a process where the roadmap is getting kind of approved. Yes, uh, you are the product manager, you are driving this. It doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to do with the roadmap. Of course, there is usually a big organization behind the roadmap and lots of resources and engineers and money and investors. At least in my case, you know, uh, Tech Influence is, uh, is a venture-backed startup. Uh, uh, there are 40 people. There, is, there are VCs involved. So the roadmap is kind of a big thing. <clears throat> so different ways or tools that you can use uh, when you uh, collect uh, data for the roadmap. Um, personally, um, I'm a great fan of customer interviews. Uh, you want to, what's called, get out of the building. Um, yes, if, if you're a product owner, you probably spend lots of time with your devs working in the sprint, but in order to come up with a good roadmap, you probably need to get out in front of customers, and if you don't have customers yet, then in front of prospects. And I'm going to try and give different scenarios for different kind of um, um, startups or different companies in a different life cycle. So I'm aware that not all of you got customers and not all startups got customers. You still want to put the roadmap. Um, there are other ways to do it, but there is lots of good ways if you already have something out there, be it like an MVP or some initial product offering, to use tools and get feedback. Uh, here at TechInfluence, we use um, actually a suite of, of couple tools. It's not one. Um, for example, for support, we use uh, Zendesk. So there is a help desk, and at any given moment, I can log in and look at tickets. Uh, we separate the bugs from uh, feature requests or product features, and then I get things assigned to product where I can pull it with my product team and start to look at what our customers are asking. <coughs> Another great way to collect feedback for your own app is um, using uh, some kind of a user behavior um, a tool, like uh, uh, we use Qualaroo. Um, what Qualaroo does is it's a, a code snippet, a piece of code that you can insert in your software for that. And if, if you have a web app, the next time a user would come in, it would just pop up. Usually it's the bottom right corner of the screen. And it, you can just go and ask questions. Uh, uh, things from, hey, do you find this thing useful to what would you like us to develop next? Um, and just use simple, plain English that your users can understand. You'll be amazed at uh, the kind of feedback that uh, you will be getting back if you just ask the, the right question, which is another kind of form of art to, to know and what, what question to ask. Um, another uh, favorite tool that we're using, and this is for what's called customer health or health metrics, is once you have a software product out there, um, you can use there is Evergate, there is uh, Tatango, there are a few other tools where you plug it in and you start looking at, we're going to talk about different kind of 
user metrics, but we get lots of good feedback about customer health, and this is um, as far as the engagement. Um, how frequent do they log into your product? When was the last login? We can even look at stream of clicks and track usage in the product. And again, all of this data is going back. We're going to talk about tools and how to kind of maintain a roadmap and a flow of stories. But this is going back to, let's just call it some queue for now, where we can start looking at this with different people and running this assessment and estimates and talk about the different feedback we're getting for the uh, roadmap. And of course, um, last but very, very important, uh, product strategy. Um, so my experience you know, uh, doing product uh, for different companies is once you have a product out there and you start getting customers, these are paid customers, and they're starting to pay for your uh, uh, product, they definitely have a say in what you are going to sit down and develop next. However, I find it uh, uh, almost critical to maintain a healthy balance uh, on your roadmap between what your customers want to build to your product strategy. Uh, uh, I think Steve Jobs once said, actually, that uh, uh, customers don't always know what they want. Um, so it's your job to actually make sure they, they know what they want and then give it the right weight you know, on your roadmap. Um, personally, I'm trying to kind of maintain a roadmap for 30% of the feedback of the things we work on is, is customer driven. Uh, and then 30% is internal, like feedback we get from the team here and, and stakeholders and people involved in building the product. And the other 33% uh, uh, so, so or third of the uh, uh, feedback is actually um, uh, driven by the market, right? So since we see where the market is heading, uh, you're going to hear from your customers what they probably need today, but they're not going to tell you what they need like six months down the road. Uh, for that, you've got to start looking at trends and market and see where the market is heading and, and come up with your product strategy. And like I said, it's, it's, it's key that you come to the roadmap with uh, already develop product strategy, even though you can iterate and revise it and change it. And Raviv, at this, at this point, uh, we actually have, we have a question uh, from Carlos. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to you, Carlos. So my question was, um, in your experience, what have been good techniques for getting uh, buy-in from you know, stakeholders? Yes, so buying from stakeholders, uh, there's lots of techniques. Uh, I would say, first and foremost, it's kind of interpersonal skills, right? It's like getting a buy-in from like, any other person uh, uh, to do something. Uh, uh, we can call it the art of uh, persuasion, or how to pursue someone to, to take action or get their buy-in. Um, so one technique I've been using is if I go out, for example, to do uh, customer interviews, I will pull them with me. So I want them to experience or see what I see, kind of, hey, take my glasses. Tell me if you can see what I see. I will take, take them out with me so they can listen to customers. It can be my VP engineering. It can be one of the lead developers. It can be the folks from customer success. But that's, I, find, I find it to be a great technique because then there is no filters, right? So they are getting the feedback first end. Um, and they, they see it, they just see it. You want to make sure that the stakeholders see what you see. And lots of the time, you know, everyone is kind of busy with their business, and you do lots of kind of running in the trenches and working with the devs, talking to the customers. Remember that in order to get a buy-in, you probably need to document and present this. Uh, another technique is, of course, data, right? So going into a stakeholder, a product stakeholders meeting, instead of saying, I think, or I believe, or I can come and put uh, some chart up on the uh, screen and say, hey, we've been tracking user logins for the past X amount of days. This is a sample of our 30 most active customers. That's what we see. Um, so data is another technique. Um, what else? Um, if, if anyone else has other ideas or, or the way they kind of get buy from stakeholders, then jump in. I think uh, I think we're good with with that one at the moment. Um, it'd be great if you could kind of just jump back into uh, the presentation, and I'll I'll let you know as soon as we got a few more. All right. So now that you collected the feedback, you know from 
different ways, different tools. Um, you want to put this feedback someplace. Um, again, based on experience and, and trying different tools, we can talk tools, but I like again to try and, and, and talk about the flow first. I like this approach by Atlassian. Uh, we're also using their products, uh, we're using Greenhopper for, uh, for the screen management, we're using Confluence to keep a kind of internal wiki. Uh, where you would usually start, when you go to your roadmap, you would usually start with, a, with kind of raw feedback. And I try not to mix raw feedback with like good product stories ready for the dev, right? So I keep, uh, I keep a Kanban, I keep a separate Kanban board actually, and I'll show you a, a screenshot in a second, where I'm just logging everything. So this is raw feedback, it's unfiltered, it's almost like note-taking. Some people do it in Evernote, other people will keep a deck, you can go online and, and store it somewhere, um, or you can you can use something like Confluence, you know, like, like a wiki, perfectly fine as long as you can keep things in order, <coughs> sorry, and kind of periodically review this. Um, then you start moving things from kind of a feedback state to what's called unprioritized. Uh, usually at this point you kind of made the decision hey, I want to work on this story. So this is the kind of story worth working on. Um, and at this point, you just know, hey, we're going to do this story at one point. You're just not sure about the how, so that's why it's called unprioritized. Um, and next, um, you're going to start moving unprioritized to a kind of prioritized state, so what's what Atlassian calls the kind of ready for feature groups. Um, and I'll share this deck with you at the end. Uh, uh, Jeremy will probably forward you the link. Uh, if you click here on the source, um, it will take you to the Fassian blog post. They're talking uh, about the process and how to uh, keep track of things, which I find highly valuable. Um, and then when the ready for feature teams, again, this is a Fassian way of doing product. Uh, we modify this process. It depends on the product you're working on. Um, for example, we work on a product which is actually a marketplace, so we go with these two apps. And then there is an interface, so we usually start with what's called a kind of sprint zero or design sprint. So the ready for the dev team would usually means, hey, we got to do some UI UX on this story. Um, if you work, for example, on an API product where there's no interface, it might, it might mean something else for you for this kind of state ready for devs. So this varies, depends on the software product you're working on. So up on the screen, you know, that's the Kanban board that I mentioned, and I have a kind of customized version, but if you take a closer look, I don't know if you can see with this resolution, it goes from what's called swim lanes, which I find very easy, but there's like million other things I can think of for you to maintain it, going from not ready yet to unprioritized to ready for the feature team and then the design where it's actually moving into the screen. Um, and the key things to remember is try not to mix your good, ready-to-go product stories with the kind of raw feedback and product as you get. Um, you probably want to keep the two separate. Um, otherwise, you're going to get into troubles with your devs, by the way. Um, your devs will tell you that, hey, this is not ready for a screen, or hey, I don't really can work on this story. For those of you being agile as far as going into kind of small chunks, you're probably going to start with something called Epic, which is just can be a one line or it can be something kind of very vague on the roadmap of things you want to develop and then break it down to very technical details right before you go into a sprint. Um, I see there are questions. Yes, Jeremy, are there any questions? About uh, just, keep, just keep going. I'll let you know if there's any questions for you. All right. Um, now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to try and focus on prioritize because I found this to probably be the most difficult part. Uh, there's so many key factors, you know, um, and there are different models. So I'm going to just give you options, and then you try and pick what works for you based on your product situation here. Um, this kind of value divided by effort equals priority. Um, the source here is uh, Bruce McCarthy from Rex. Uh, there's a great uh, post up with a presentation about how to use this model. But basically what he's saying is, uh, you look at the x-axis and the y-axis, x is the effort, y is the value, you're trying, of course, and pick 
at least you know going agile, you're gonna try and pick high value, low effort, you always in first, so you can iterate and move fast. Um, yes, from time to time you're gonna need and tackle um, a kind of high effort, high value. It's probably gonna spread over multiple screens if you're doing agile. Um, but you want to make sure it definitely works the work of you, of your team. Um, the one situation you want to kind of try and avoid is working on a high effort, low value. Now, I bet the next question would be, so how do you define value? Um, value is subjective. Um, and usually, you know, at least the, the way I see value would probably be uh, a derivative of your business goal. Right, so I'm going to show the next uh, uh, technique, you know, for prioritizing. It goes by business goals. Is your goal to expand your user base? Is your goal to do validated learning? Is the goal to increase revenues? You look at the business goal, you come back, you would understand value, and would be able to apply this formula or this technique. Um, as far as effort, um, again, depends on your skill set and knowledge and expertise. Sometimes, if you're more technical and you know what's involved, you would be able to estimate the effort. There are different ways to estimate effort, and again, that depends on the um, um, on the way you run development. But if, if, if it's agile, then usually you go by story points. And then, in, in my case, since it's a complex uh, uh, product and there are many devs involved, uh, in order to estimate effort, I would probably need to get with the lead devs in the room, the front end and the back end, and, and put some estimate, a rough estimate on this for me to prioritize. Another great way to prioritize your roadmap uh, is uh, the startup metrics for pirates. If you're not familiar with this uh, 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 post by David Flores, there is a link on the deck. Um, and this is going by business goals. So we talked about business goals. Um, and this maps it to five different business goals. Again, depends on the kind of product you're working on and where you are as far as the life cycle of your product. Um, starting with acquisition, the idea is you want to win new users. So then you go back to your roadmap, look at features, and say, okay, this feature can win me new users. Uh, uh, this can be anything from kind of closing on a viral loop, you know, where you're going to work on a feature that, for example, if you're working on a social app, lets the user share it on the social network that can win you new users. That's one example. Um, next is activation. Activation is you already have the users. Now you are looking to convert existing users. It can be from free to pay if you have a free product and you want to uh, make them pay, or you can even convert them from a, a low tier to a higher kind of product tier um, and upgrade them. Um, and again, this depends on the product, but if you're working on a, on a freemium, this can be something that would actually let the user, um, I can see, you know, in, in our product, you actually got to upload your content contributor. So there is a feature which is a self-serve that lets the user import more contributors and in order to do this, they usually need to go into a higher product tier, the perfect kind of activation feature. Um, then there is retention. And retention is you have the user, you want to work on a feature to bring them back in. Uh, this can be some integration, for example, with uh, email automation, where a uh, transactional email that generates a reminder for a user to come back because there is some sort of things going you know, in your product, you bring them back. You're working on a retention feature. Um, revenue, I want to believe this one is easy. No need to explain. You want to monetize us users. Um, I usually, by the way, I usually try and assign a dollar number to every feature I'm working on. Uh, that's I find it a great exercise. Go to your roadmap and say, OK, I have to put a dollar number. Um, there's also another uh, great game where you actually, if you have other stakeholders, actually, it's another technique. I think Carlos asked about the technique to get the buy-in. If you want to get buy-in for prioritization, um, there is what's called this kind of quasi-money or monopoly money where you give them uh, uh, money to buy features. And then you say, OK, now let's see you guys spending your money on features. And you'll be surprised once people have very limited resources. I think this probably demonstrates the limited resources of devs and time and whatnot, where they go and they buy features. 
and, and put price on features. So that's talking about revenue, it's a good practice to try and, and put dollar numbers on features. Um, and last is, of course, referrals. And these are features that uh, are going to make the user refer new users. Um, I'm going to see if there are any questions right now. Yeah, so I got, uh, we got one question again from Carlos. Yeah, my question was um, about the magic quadrant you just showed for the value effort um, criteria. Do you have any other criteria that you map out uh, when you're prioritizing? Yes, um, once Jeremy shares the link with you and you go to the full kind of blog post, um, there is a discussion about search energy. And that's another kind of parameter, which is value divided by effort times search energy. Um, it's more tricky now because in order to be searching, you got to get kind of multiple signals. Um, for example, before I, we have this practice here where we take feedback. We I'll, I'll share my roadmap with you in a second. You'll see we kind of put we keep a scoreboard of things that people or users ask for, and then we look for patterns. So it's not enough for one user to tell you, "Hey, I want feature X." We're gonna keep tracking this, and then if it comes up, you know, another ten times in the next, let's say, months, or two months, or whatever time frame, that's a signal. Then the level of searching is going to go up, you know, and that's going to drive your value divided by priority time search energy into even higher priority. So it's a good question, um, and there are different again different techniques to to keep uh, track of uh, searching. Yeah. Excellent. Let's uh, continue uh, where you left off. All right. Um, so the three buckets, the three buckets technique, you know, for prioritization, it's uh, somehow simplifying uh, the first uh, metrics for uh, pirates, and it, it just simplifies things to, hey, I have customer requests, I have metrics movers, and I have things I want to do to divide my customers, which is going to lead us uh, into the canoe model in a second. Um, but customer request, yeah, that's that's simple. Uh, that's things that customers are actively requesting, and like I say, you should probably keep some sort of a scoreboard. Uh, it's usually not enough for one customer to ask this, unless again, maybe this is uh, what's called a, a, a whale or a really big customer. Even still, you know, even if it's a very big customer, you want to keep track of this and see that this kind of request fits your product strategy and fits other things. So we talked about kind of balancing your own. Um Metrics movers, these are features that will actually move your target business and product metrics significantly. Um, um, and in, in, in most LC product organizations, these are specific goals and strategies uh, behind the decision to, to invest in a product or a feature. Uh, this can be engagement, this can be growth, this can be revenue. Um, now, typically, very few features are actually metrics movers. So when you see them, this is actually like goal, like mark them and keep kind of eagle eye on, on, on this kind of feature request. If that's a metric mover, it's probably a good one. Um, the last one is the customer delight. This is where um, customers haven't necessarily asked for it, but, but literally delight them, you know, when, when, when it's the light them when they see. Um, for example, this can be a social signing where I don't need to provide my password and, and then go to another kind of user password. You know, this delights. The kind of express checkout or one click, Amazon one click, you know, uh, many years ago when people found out about it, it's like, wow. They, um, I don't know if this was a specific request, but it's definitely kind of a, a delightful product experience. Uh, um, now, the, these are kind of tricky features to identify. Typically, these are features that require several ingredients. Uh, you got to listen to your customers, you got to understand the pain, you got to leverage, you know, the knowledge of, of, of the technology. Um, to know exactly what might be possible, talk to your devs, um, and then of course you got to come up with the innovative design uh, to to do this elegant and delightful experience. Uh, and again, usually the type of experience uh, uh, it's more kind of advanced level. You see for more mature products where there's like interaction designers involved. Um, but yeah, th these are fun. These are fun. Uh, if you can uh, kind of balance your roadmap around these kind of three buckets, 
you are uh, in a perfect situation. And, um, uh, and Raviv, it looks like we have another question, uh, this time from Franz. Hey there. So how do you factor in competitor activity uh, into your feature prioritization? So if you find your competitors are adding features that uh, users seem to want, how do, you, how do you factor that into some of the models that you walk through? Great question. Thanks, Franz. Um, so competition is falling on the market. Um, I mentioned before that uh, you would probably want to keep a balanced roadmap with 30% customer feedback, 30% internal, 30% market. This is where competition fits in. However, I would advise you to be careful with it. Um, uh, again, uh, I made the mistake in my past of kind of chasing uh, new shiny objects and say, hey, we should really work on this just because competitor X or Y just released this feature. Um, again, you got to cross reference with all the other indicators. Um, and if it fits the product strategy, and if you can assign a dollar number for this, and if there are enough customers with a very common use case for your product that can use this feature, then I would say, yeah, go ahead and, and grab this in. I mean, it's, it's, it's key to listen to the competition. You've got to be able, you know, as a product lead, to always be um, um, the, uh, the, the person in the organization that knows everything about what's out there and what's the features and the way things work. Uh, it doesn't mean that you always need to go and develop this kind of new shiny object just because your competitor works. Uh, but again, if it fits with all the other signals, go ahead and prioritize this and, and go build it. Does it make sense? Right, you need. Perfect. All right. Um, come back to uh, the deck. And talk about uh, the canoe model. That's actually my favorite uh, uh, prioritization model. Um, and like every other pretty much efficient process out there, it was invented by the Japanese. Uh, very good with processes. Um, it's it's a theory of product development actually, and, and customer satisfaction. It was developed uh, in the 80s by Professor Noriaki Kanu. Uh, named after him, uh, used in uh, Japanese car manufacturers. I think Toyota is using this. And what this model offers is, is some insights into product attributes, um, which are perceived to be important by, by your customers. Uh, and the purpose of this tool is, is to support product specification and, and discussion uh, by, by better development of, of team understanding. You ask me about a buy-in, you know, I, I use the Kanu model to get a buy-in, and I'll, I'll work you through the well, we, we can have a, a full hour just talking about this model, but I'll try to kind of simplify this and work, work you through the, uh, the basic. But um, the idea is that you have a technique here for mapping uh, uh, customer responses uh, based on feedback you get um, to three buckets. Again, the idea of buckets, which are basic performance and excitement. Um, and I will jump to the next slide just to explain this, this chart, and then we can jump back if, if you probably going to have questions. Um, I think one of the best ways to explain Kanu model, and that's the way it was explained to me many years ago, um, and I, I still carry this kind of example, is um, from uh, the uh, hospitality industry. Um, when you think about a basic feature, when you check in a, in a hotel room, a basic feature, for example, would be, hey, I, I expect to have a running hot water when I, when I open the, uh, the water in the shower. Um, so again, depends on your product. Um, a basic feature, for example, in our case, you know, we work in a social content marketing. A basic feature is for a, a content contributor to be able to compose uh, an original piece of content in the platform and then share it with uh, his or her social channels. Um, that's the, that's the basic feature as part of what you are building. Um, and then next um, is the performance bucket. Now, performance, again, going back to hospitality, would be something like express checking. Register here. I don't have to wait in line. Um, when it comes to product, performance can be many things. Performance can be... Um, um, how responsive is your app? You know, performance can be, hey, we need to go mobile, you know, 
It's part of the performance. It's a very common use case. Performance can be the time it takes to uh, get the web service or the data query back. Um, and that's a discussion I have with friends, you know, about the app being kind of slow. Um, that's performance. Uh, you probably want to start with your basic and then do the performance and see how you can speed up things. Now, it doesn't need to be technical uh, performance. It can be, for example, we talked about the social signing. Um, a social signing used to be kind of the light feature, but when you look at consumer apps these days, it's almost like a commodity, right? Everyone is doing social signing. You know, especially when you're on a mobile, you're not going to start and put a kind of new user and password. You want to just go get in and, and kind of work. It, right now, so we're looking at a performance feature. And then there is, we talked about the delight. So this is the chocolate on the pillow when you come back from the short excursion, you know, back to your uh, uh, room. Um, and it's all neat and clean and uh, there is this chocolate, and it puts a smile on your face. Uh, uh, go back, if you have experience, uh, kind of good hospitality. Uh, go back to that experience, and you'll see what I'm talking about with product. Um, and again, this is a higher level of sophistication. You've got to make sure you have the right resources and the designers to get there. But when you see this, you know, it's, it's really amazing uh, product experience. Um, and if uh, anyone in the forum actually have more examples of uh, delightful product experience, jump in. I'd, I'd love to hear. All right. Um, so, key takeaways from using the uh, Canoe model, and then I'll move to the roadmap I'm keeping and show you how I'm using this. Um, you want to start with the basics. Don't jump and think you can delight the users before you even know them. Depends on where you are with your product. Maybe you just go through an MVP. Capture the basic, make sure that you write user stories for what it needs to do at a very basic level. Um, you definitely want to invest in performance, um, but performance for the right users, right? Um, again, focus is important. You try and go and identify the most critical persona of your product for the success, and I would say for the financial success of your product, and focus on them. You can be everything for everyone. I tried it before with product. It doesn't work. You're going to fail. Um, focus on your most critical persona and what they need for performance and go build it. Um, next is, of course, uh, the delight, but we already talked about it. You really need the kind of intimate experience with your customers. You've got to know them by name. You've got to get on the phone. You've got to collect all this data before you know how to do that. Um, and remember that you've got to kind of constantly visit and revisit this kind of model, because things are going to change over time, and that's the very basic of the Canoe model. Uh, we keep a very dynamic and iterative roadmap uh, that almost changes on a, I want to say, on a two-week basis, you know. I'm constantly playing with things based on feedback, things are dynamic. Uh, France, to your question about our competition, things that used to be basic, um, things, sorry, things that used to be kind of excitement or delight, and become kind of basic because, hey, your three top competitors are already doing this feature. Um, does it mean you need to build it tomorrow? Like I said, probably not. You've got to just factor this in with everything else. Um, any more questions on the Kano model? No, we're good. Keep going. Right. Um, so finally, I get to show you my role then. <laughs> um, and I'm actually using a custom um, template. Uh, it's called Blueprint. If uh, using uh, um, Atlassian and Jira, or you uh, considering using them, um, they, like they recently launched this kind of Blueprint things. I want to say during the last year, um, and I had to go in and customize this, of course, to fit uh, our workflow and uh, what we work on. But from left to right, if you look at my columns. Um, I have some sort of a title or epic, and I'll show you another kind of template for epic or how to capture a story with feedback and work on it. Um, then we have we, we have a marketplace, so we have two different apps. So I'm all I'm keeping track of the, the app, and we also have different use cases. Like I said, it can be more than one persona using your product. So we have use cases for brands, use cases for agencies. We have the tool and we have the marketplace. But then you notice the column called requests. And that's my kind of scoreboard where 
um, a customer uh, is usually getting an X and an uh, internal uh, uh, stakeholder would get a Y and then I keep track of the X's and the Y's and taking notes of who said what, of what day to ask for this feature um, and this is how I kind of escalate and prioritize. Uh, to the right you see man sprints. Uh, this is me sitting with our VP engineering and uh, estimating. And then, of course, there is the shipping date. Now, you notice on the roadmap, and I would suggest you do the same, you do not want to commit to a certain date. Uh, again, been there in the past, can lead to lots of disappointment with your customers. There is like, lots of things that can uh, 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 be out of your control. Um, our approach is we would say something like, hey, this is the area of focus, or this is on the roadmap. And internally, you know, we keep track, and we go back to stakeholders and the team here and say, hey, this is Q1, this is Q2. But working agile, you work in two week sprints, and this is dynamic. This can change in any moment. You don't want to put a, a, a concrete date there. And last is the, the uh, not last, but the stakeholder, but you see there is the status of the, um, the story or the feature, and you see there are a few features that have been released. There is things in progress, so it's in the sprint, it's been delayed, and the stakeholder responsible for it. Um, I promise you are going to see the kind of epic uh, template I'm using. Uh, and again, that's a blueprint uh, inside JIRA. It's tough to see, but I will read it for you. And when you go and you visit the deck, you will be able to see the fields. You can just go and make a template for yourself from here. You don't have to you know, uh, uh, necessarily pay for this. But we capture the use case. We capture the shipping day, the status, the request from people. And then it goes by goals. So you want to make sure you tie it to a business goal. We talked about it that there is a good background and strategic fit, so there is a space for this, that you make all the assumptions, and then you start listing the technical requirements, which is part of the template, um, any user interactions and design attachments, and then there is a place for questions. Again, that works for me. You might have any other kind of templates you're using, or you can take this and, and, and build a template, something you can capture feed. Um, this is a Trello board, um, another great tool. Um, in my uh, past company. Um, kind of Kanban approach, you see it's moving from considerations to known issues to up next to in progress to ship. Another um, a great way to keep track of feedback. And then um, I guess I have a few more minutes before Jeremy is going to uh, cut me here. Um, I want to last talk about the public versus private roadmap. Uh, um, and again, that's, that's a challenge. If you are Intel, then you can afford to keep your roadmap kind of public. Uh, not by dates, but at least by, you know, first half of the year, second half of the, of the year. Um, plus, there is, you know, when you're Intel, there is so many other businesses and organizations and users that actually depend on the roadmap. But if you are not Intel, then most of the chances that you want to keep your product roadmap private or uh, um, uh, might be able to afford some level of uh, transparency. Um, and the issues, again, this depends on your product, um, is you want to look at transparency versus confidentiality. Lots of the things I hear is, hey, of course, we're not going to share our roadmap, you know, anyone can take a look at this. That's fine, but there are some times, you know, whether it's for the press or, or, or you want to actually use something like user voice and let your users kind of vote for things where there are some cases where you might want to put your product out, out there. Um, the other uh, factor is uh, what's called the blue ocean, blue ocean uh, versus uh, red ocean. Um, something you can Google up, you know, it's, it's a business strategy where if you are in a blue ocean where there is not too much competition, like maybe you can be more uh, uh, loose with your roadmap and put it out there, but if that's a red ocean with lots of competition, Keep it close to your chat. You don't want to share too much of this. Um, and then you can use uh, a public roadmap to qualify the right customers. That's another technique I've been using, right? So if you basically publish what you're going to work on next, um, naturally, you know, this is going to attract some type of customers, and then probably other customers are going to drop out uh, uh, looking at what you're building and if that's a good or, or a bad fit. So that can, can use it uh, to your advantage as a technique. Um, Things I've been doing in the past is usually I keep two versions. There is a more detailed roadmap, you know, which we use internally. And then if I need to share the vision or put something out there, or I want to be very specific and ask my uh, customers and users. 
I, we, I can do a password protected, or I can just put something very basic there. Um, so this is uh, my take on uh, public versus private. Uh, and this is where my presentation comes to an end. And you know, I'll turn this to Jeremy and for our discussion. Awesome. Um, Raviv, this, this was great. We actually don't have any more questions. Uh, I, think it, I think that's a testament to a really good presentation there. So again, thank you to our speaker, Raviv Turner, VP of TAP Influence on leading this conversation and creating, maintaining, and prioritizing a roadmap and showing us all the different types of flavors, all the different types of ways of prioritizing. Um, and again, just to everyone who attended, everyone in the room, everyone watching the live stream online, again, a big thank you from me, Jeremy Horn, the product guy, um, and to everyone else who joined us today and the product mentor. Um, if you're interested in being a product mentor, very much like Raviv, you know, look, look, it's Raviv, uh, wave hi. Hi. Okay, there. A little slow on the high. Thumbs up. He's giving us a thumbs up. I like that. Okay. Uh, so, if you want to be a product mentor like Raviv, uh, help getting paired up with other people, helping other product people be better, better product managers, creating better products, making better decisions. Uh, definitely come to theproductmentor.com and sign up. And now my lights went off. Uh, but hey, I'm actually still here, so don't worry. Um, and uh, if you're interested in a product job. Uh, we have a free product board for product people uh, looking for product jobs as well as other individuals um, who are also uh, uh, seeking product jobs. And you can go to theproductjobs.com. Um, and with that said, again, thank you everyone for attending. And don't worry, my lights will come back soon. And next time uh, we'll have another great, wonderful speaker. And everyone wave goodbye. Bye. All right. Thanks. <laughs>